Unit 7, Ideologies or Isms and Revolutions, including Romanticism. This is the period between 1815 and 1850 that we're covering in this lecture. This is a graphic for you showing you politics in what is called the long 19th century. If you look at the dates, you see that it really is longer than a century. It starts in 1789 with the beginning of the French Revolution, and it carries through 1914 with the end of the age of mass politics and the beginning of World War I. So that's why we call it a long 19th century. And basically we will be covering the last three sections of the long 19th century. We actually began already with the end of the 18th century with what we covered in the French Revolution and Napoleon in Unit 6. So uh, this unit we're going to be focusing on the second section here, the age of Metternich as it's sometimes called, between 1815 and 1848. We'll discuss the Congress of Vienna, the Concert of Europe, the revolutions of 1830 and 1848, reforms in Britain, the birth of liberalism and nationalism versus conservatism and romanticism. We will also cover the Industrial Revolution. Key concept. First, we're going to start with an overview. This is mostly review of things that we have discussed uh, at the end of Unit 6, leading into, of course, this unit. We will begin the real lecture with the blanks to fill in with the Congress of Vienna. Conservatism and the Age of Metternich. The Congress of Vienna begins meeting in 1815, which is to bring about the end of the Napoleonic Age. It represented a temporary triumph for the restore of the old conservative order that had been in place prior to the French Revolution. This era of conservatism, as it's called, was best represented by the leadership and policies of the Austrian minister Clemens von Metternich. We were introduced to him at the end of the Napoleonic lectures. Uh, he was the chief minister in Austria. Austria still had a, um, an emperor, but his right-hand man, if you will, um, was Otto, um, sorry, was uh, Clemens von Metternich. Napoleon had been defeated and the former rulers had been restored to power in their respective countries. The Bourbons in France, of course, and the Pope in the Papal States are also included in that. The victors at the Congress of Vienna, which is kind of the summit meeting, a uh, peace treaty meeting to bring about an end to the Napoleonic era, uh, these victors at the Congress of Vienna sought to prevent the new forces of liberalism and nationalism that had been let loose by the French Revolution and Napoleon from disturbing the conservative order that they were trying to restore throughout Europe. There would be a repression. Repression was used in a number of instances to put down liberal or nationalist challenges throughout this um, generation uh, between 1815 and 1848. The Concert of Europe was established at the Congress of Vienna. It would be a kind of international organization uh, that would, it was the clearest and most effective expression of conservatism. Its role would be to maintain the balance of power in Europe by repressing any liberal or national um, revolts key concept. The rise of liberalism is a big part of what's going on as a byproduct of the French Revolution. <clears throat> the liberalism unleashed by the French Revolution was largely kept in check during the years following the Congress of Vienna until around 1830 or so. Liberalism became a major force starting in France, of course. Uh, during the revolutions of both 1830 and 1848, both of which we'll discuss later in this lecture. The Bourbon monarchy would eventually be overthrown in 1830, and it would be replaced with a man named King Louis-Philippe, also known as the Bourgeois King. Uh, 
France became a republic eventually, abandoning having a constitutional monarchy even. Uh, by the time we get to the end of the 1848 uh, era. Although this republic only lasted in reality four years, it will give way eventually to the rise of another Bonaparte as an emperor, Emperor Napoleon III. We'll discuss that as we move forward as well. Liberalism, however, resulted in a number of important reforms in Britain by 1850. Now remember, liberalism is basically what we now refer to in the 19th century of what we now refer to of what had, has been called the Enlightenment ideals. So in a new century, you know, in the 19th century, we refer to it as liberalism. Liberalism was birthed by the Enlightenment ideals. So liberalism now resulted in a number of important reforms in some areas. Even though it was re being repressed on the continent of Europe, there were some places where it was succeeding, in particular in Great Britain, due to the already, um, uh, I guess you would say, reformed government that they had with their constitutional monarchy, with their uh, balance of power between the um, monarch and parliament. Uh, we will discuss some certain reforms that will be put forth in Great Britain to make even more changes that will represent liberal ideas, giving more people a say in government, um, etc. as we move through this lecture. Things like the Great Reform Bill of 1832 and the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846. So don't worry about not knowing what those mean now. We'll discuss those as we go forward. Key concept. The emergence of nationalism is another big ism that we will discuss in this lecture. Okay, so we have liberal conservatism, of course, a return to conservatism um, for a while after the defeat of Napoleon. We have liberalism, of course, as a byproduct of the French Revolution and Napoleon, um, the 19th century version of Enlightenment idealism. And now, of course, we also have nationalism as an ism. You see why we call this lecture the isms lecture. Uh, nationalism became perhaps the greatest force for revolution in the period between 1815 and 1850. Uh, nationalism will be one of the big isms that we will discuss throughout this entire second half of AP Euro. Um, nationalism as well as industrialism um, will ultimately change society completely um, and ultimately lead to the more um, modern age that we know to this very day. Italy, just some examples here that we'll discuss as we go through this, Italy will revolt against the Austrian rule in northern Italy in particular in 1830 and in 1848. We'll discuss both. A revolution in Prussia will happen in 1848, but it resulted in a failed attempt to unify Germany. Germany will not be unified until 1871, which we'll discuss in a later unit. The Austrian Empire saw nationalist revolts by Hungarians and Bohemians. All of these we will discuss in later, uh, later on in this, in this lecture. Greece will also uh, gain its independence, actually. They will have a nationalist revolt against the Ottoman Empire that had taken over most of Greece uh, a couple of centuries before. And they will finally have success in, um, in gaining their independence, the Greek War for Independence, um, or the Greek Revolution, as it's sometimes called, in 1832. Belgium will win its independence from the Netherlands in 1830 and be its own separate nation. Poland, unfortunately, failed in its attempt to gain independence between 1830 and 1831. Britain and Russia were spared from nationalist revolutions. When we talk about these revolutions that happen in the mid-century, in particular 1848, uh, later on in this lecture, we will discuss how they happen all over Europe. It's like a revolutionary virus um, that spreads throughout Europe. But there were two uh, notable exceptions, Great Britain on one end of Europe and Russia on the other end of Europe, kind of 
bookends, if you will. Neither of them will suffer nationalist revolutions, but for completely different reasons, and we'll discuss those as we go through the lecture as well. Key concept. Romanticism is another ism that we see coming about during this time as a byproduct of the French Revolution. It was a philosophy that challenged the rationalism of the Enlightenment. It's almost the, um, I guess you'd say the other side of the coin of liberalism. Um, philosophy will challenge the rationalism of the, of the Enlightenment and instead emphasize individualism, emotion, faith, and nature. In some respects, Romanticism can be seen as a knee-jerk reaction against the age of reason. They see too much science and too much reason as uh, being too uh, clinical or too um, unhuman. Uh, lack of feeling, lack of emotion does not seem human to the romantic, so they react against it. They saw instead a new social order, an economic order based on equality. So even though they are against some of the ideas of the age of reason, they are not completely the opposite of Enlightenment idealism. Key concept. Socialism is another ism that will be discussed. This one we actually are going to save to discuss uh, in uh, more detail when we cover the industrialization lecture in this same unit, but the, the second lecture of this unit. But socialism is another ism that we see popping up in the 19th century. Uh, it will challenge the bourgeoisie for its mistreatment or maltreatment of workers during the Industrial Revolution. It is yet another knee-jerk reaction against the Industrial Age, which is a byproduct of the Age of Reason. Uh, looking at the the uh, downside of industrialization and trying to appeal to make changes uh, uh, to that. It advocated a new social and economic order based on equality, much like we saw with the Romantics. So a lot of times Romantics were socialists. The Congress of Vienna. Let's start here with discussing how Europe puts itself back together after the age of Napoleon. It begins in September of 1814 and continues until June of 1815. Representatives of the major powers of Europe, even including France, they met to redraw the territorial lines and to try to restore the social and political order of the Ancien Regime. Now, what's interesting about this is, yes, this is a peace treaty negotiation. They, of course, as, as normal, invite the losers, if you will, of the wars, the Napoleonic Wars, the losers ultimately will be France at the end, um, but they were also invited for the negotiations to have a say in what should happen, so that is significant. The reason I'm mentioning this is because after World War I, a century later, the losers will not be invited to the treaty negotiations, and that will cause all kinds of problems in the long run. We'll discuss more about that when we get there. Okay, so the big four members of the Congress of Vienna were, of course, the victors um, from the European coalition that had formed against France, Austria, England, Prussia, and Russia. Clemens von Metternich represented Austria as the chief minister of Austria, if you will, the right-hand man of the Austrian emperor. Uh, he himself epitomized the conservative reaction that we see carry through Europe between 1815 and 1848. That's why sometimes we refer to it as the age of Metternich. It's also known as the age of conservatism. He opposed the ideas of liberals and reformers because of the impact such forces would have on his own nation, the multinational or um, polyglot Habsburg Empire. Now remember, we've talked about this before, how the Austrian Empire um, is made up of a bunch of different ethnic groups, different language groups, different people, 
And because of that, it's hard to create unity in that empire. Um, if nationalism takes hold in the Austrian Empire, since there's all these different ethnic groups, um, then if they all if they each decide they want their own independent nation, then ultimately the Austrian Empire will unravel. That is why the leadership in Austria fears nationalism so much. And since nationalism and liberalism seem to go hand in hand, nationalism as a byproduct of the Enlightenment, liberalism as a byproduct of the Enlightenment, uh, basically Austria fears both of these. England was represented by Lord Castlereagh, a member of parliament um, who will uh, be sent to, rep to represent England in the negotiations. He sought a balance of power by trying to surround France with larger and stronger states, wanting to contain France from ever being able to have a Napoleon-like impact on Europe ever again. So even though he's from a more classically liberal nation, uh, he did have some conservative ideas because, of course, England does not want uh, France or any other nation from that matter to get too large or too influential on the continent because it could hurt the balance of power which ultimately could hurt England and their influence. Prussia sought to recover Prussian territory that had been lost to Napoleon in 1807 and they also wanted to gain more territory in northern Germany for example Saxony. They were hoping that this would be one of the benefits for ending the war on the winning side. And of course we have Russia. The Tsar himself, Tsar Alexander I, went as the representative of Russia. He didn't send, you know, another state official. He went himself. Tsar Alexander I demanded free and independent Poland but with himself as king. Now folks, that's not a free and independent Poland. That's a Poland that is under the thumb of Russia. France will also be one of the, you know, uh, countries that attends the Congress as we know, but they're not one of the big four because they were the defeated power. They later become involved in the deliberations after uh, Napoleon's 100 days is over and after the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy once again um, after the 100 days. They will be represented or France will be represented by Talleyrand. Talleyrand was the French foreign minister. He had been a noble before the French Revolution. He had sided with the Third Estate when the revolution began. He had survived all of the upheaval during the moderate and then, of course, radical phases of the revolution. Uh, he uh, also put himself at the disposal of the directory during the directory phase and then put himself at the disposal of Napoleon as a diplomat once Napoleon was in power. He was the chameleon of France. He will survive everything in order to come out on top, ultimately, as the French foreign minister. Now, the principles of settlement at the Congress of Vienna are based around three big things, legitimacy, compensation, and balance of power. We'll discuss each of those. Legitimacy meant returning power to the ruling families that had been deposed by more than two decades of revolutionary warfare, in particular during the Napoleonic Age. The Bourbons, of course, will be restored in France, Spain, and Naples. The dynasties would be restored in places like Holland, Sardinia, Tuscany, and Modena. And the Papal States will return to the Pope. They had been taken by Napoleon. Compensation meant territorially rewarding those states which had made considerable sacrifices to defeat Napoleon. England received naval bases in many different places, Malta, Ceylon, Cape of Good Hope, 
Austria recovered the Italian province of Lombardy in northern Italy, and they were also awarded adjacent Venetia as well as Galatia from Poland. So northern Italy ultimately belonged to Austria, and the Illyrian provinces along the Adriatic as well. Russia was given most of Poland, even though the, the Tsar wanted all of it, uh, but they did allow him to have most of it with the Tsar as king, as well as Russia being given Finland and Bessarabia, modern-day Molda Moldova, and western Ukraine. Prussia was awarded the Rhineland around the Rhine River and three-fifths of Saxony. As, and, and also even part of Poland, the part that was not given to Russia. Sweden received Norway, control over Norway. And the third thing, balance of power. It arranged the map, the Congress of Vienna arranged the map of Europe so that never again could one state upset the international order and cause a general war like what had happened during um, the previous century. The encirclement of France was achieved through the following. A strength of Netherlands, the, um, united, they united the Austrian Netherlands or Belgium with Holland to form the Kingdom of the United Netherlands north of France. Prussia received Rhineish lands bordering the eastern French frontier, the left bank of the Rhine River. And Switzerland received a guarantee of perpetual neutrality. If you ever wondered why Switzerland is always neutral in all wars uh, from the 19th century on to the current day, this is why. Right here they received a guarantee of perpetual neutrality. The end of the Habsburg Holy Roman Empire once again. Now, I know we have said that technically the Holy Roman Empire was ended, quote unquote, uh, with 1648 with the Treaty of Westphalia, but we know that it continued to be around kind of in some respects, uh, you know, throughout the next two centuries. Ultimately, we see it formally end once again. Um, it had been main, it, it maintained, they, the Congress of Vienna will maintain Napoleon's reorganization of the German Confederation, however. He had reorganized it, made it more manageable rather than having, you know, hundreds of little German states um, creating, um, you know, a few dozen um, German states instead. The German Confederation will be called the Bund. It will be a loose confederation as well, where members remained virtually sovereign in their own nations. Sardinia, or Piedmont, as it's sometimes called, sometimes it's just referred to as Sardinia Piedmont, or Piedmont Sardinia, um, in northern Italy, will uh, have its former territory restored with the addition of Genoa. A compromise on Poland was reached uh, sometimes referred to as Congress Poland because of the Congress of Vienna. As I said before, it, cre it was created with Alexander I of Russia as the King of Congress Poland, which was most of Poland, um, not all of it, but most of it, and it lasted for 15 years. Only Britain remained as a growing power. They began a century of world leadership from 1814 to 1914. But instead of their power growing by gaining territories in Europe, they are gaining more and more territories abroad. And we'll talk about that in the next several units, the growth of the British Empire. The sun never sets on the British Empire. So here's a map of Europe as set by the Congress of Vienna. You see which territories were given to what states you see the boundaries of the German Confederation. You see that France has now been reduced back to what it had been roughly to 1792. Uh, you see how um, territories were given to Russia and Prussia when it comes to Poland in particular, um, etc.
restoration of balance of power. So the evaluation of the Congress of Vienna. It did successfully restore the European balance of power. It did do that. Uh, it was not until Germany's unification happened in 1871 that the balance of power would again be compromised. We'll discuss that in a later unit. That's going to throw everything into a tizzy, but that's not until 1871. Uh, no world wars will occur between 1815 and 1914 as a result of this balance of power established at the Congress of Vienna. But it's criticized by liberals and nationals for creating an atmosphere that repressed reforms and nationalist movements for a generation. This age of Metternich or age of conservatism between 1815 and 1848 is also seen by liberals and nationals as an age of repression. It underestimated the new nationalism generated by the French Revolution, trying to squash it. But as we know, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Key concept. Key concept. Key concept. So let's discuss the Concert of Europe, which was an international body created at the Congress of Vienna to maintain that balance of power between 1815 and the 1850s. This was lasted from the Congress of Vienna in 1815 until roughly the Crimean War that happened in the mid-1850s. Some believe it was shattered by earlier revolutions of 1848, however. Ultimately, what the Concert of Europe is, is a series of arrangements created to enforce the status quo as defined by the Congress of Vienna Settlement. To make an organization put in place to maintain the balance of power that had been created at the Congress of Vienna. It was highly conservative in nature. All of the major powers would belong to it, and basically they all agreed to send in armed forces into any area of Europe where nationalist or liberal uprisings took place to squash them in order to maintain the balance of power. Um, oftentimes when I describe this, I use the analogy of a pressure cooker. Um, a pressure cooker, of course, is a pot um, that your mom may have in her kitchen which uh, basically seals, has a top that locks, and it seals and it um, creates pressure with a little bit of water in there. It creates pressure and steam to cook something fairly quickly. Um, a pressure cooker works great, but every now and then you have to release the steam. There's a little valve on the top with it. You can release the steam, and oftentimes pressure cookers have a little um, rocking mechanism that sits on the top and every now and then lets a little steam out to regulate the pressure on the inside of the pot. The idea behind that is to keep it from exploding, of course. If you don't release the pressure at least a little bit every now and then, you'll have an explosion on your hands. Well, the Concert of Europe is the pressure cooker that will uh, try to maintain balance of power in Europe for this generation between 1815 and the 1850s. But because there was very little release valve of any of that pressure going on, it was mostly repression rather than allowing some um, steam to uh, escape every now and then, it will cause some explosions to happen. And the biggest explosions will be in the revolutions of 1848 that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the revolutions of 1848, as I said, seemed kind of as a revolutionary virus starting in France, spreading to the rest of Europe little revolutions popping up all over Europe are seen as a reaction against this conservative repression put in place by the Concert of Europe. This will be discussed throughout the rest of this lecture. Just wanted to give you that analogy so you can kind of keep that in your mind as we go through this. So it's highly conservative in nature as I said. Uh, essentially it was a crusade against liberalism and nationalism and Metternich as the chief minister of Austria was the primary architect of creating this concert of Europe body to maintain that balance of power through conservative repression. Two major provisions were part of the concert of Europe, the quadruple alliance and the Congress system. 
The Quadruple Alliance was, of course, the main victors of the Napoleonic Wars, Russia, Prussia, Austria, and England. They provided for a concerted action against any threat to peace or the balance of power. They all maintained that they would send in armed forces to put down any rebellions based on um, liberalism or nationalism that would threaten the balance of power in Europe. France was usually seen as the possible violator of this Vienna settlement, so they would keep a close watch on France. France would, after, um, you know, after the, I don't know, the mid-1800s, they will eventually be invited into the Concert of Europe. Uh, the final, you know, maybe handful of years of its existence, um, but still not very um, trusted by the rest of the na nations of Europe. The alliance agreed that no Bonaparte should ever again govern France. Ha! Uh, as I said earlier, there will eventually be a Emperor Napoleon III put on the throne in France, but that does not happen until after the 1848 revolutions. Austria used the alliance to defend the status quo as established at Vienna, the Congress of Vienna, against any change or threat to the system. And liberalism and nationalism were now seen as threats to the existing order. Now remember, Metternich is the primary architect. He's a staunch conservative. He believes that liberalism and nationalism are dangerous. This is largely because he is from Austria where liberalism and nationalism could cause the Austrian Empire that is multi-ethnic in nature to unravel if they settled in. Since Austria is the host nation of the Congress of Vienna and he is representing Austria, he has a lot of influence over the negotiations at the Congress of Vienna and that is why the Concert of Europe will have such a, a strong conservative nature to it because that's the way he created it. The Congress system is the other part of the Concert of Europe. So you, we just discussed the Quadruple Alliance, now the Congress system. Uh, it would be European international relations being controlled by a series of meetings that would be held by the great powers to monitor and defend the status quo. In other words, they agreed to meet on a semi-regular basis to make sure that the balance of power and the status quo with more regular conservative powers in place, meaning monarchs, monarchies, uh, were maintained. The principle of collective security required unanimity um, among the members of the Quadruple Alliance. So if they didn't have a unanimous agreement in the members of the Quadruple Alliance, then it would be difficult for the Concert of Europe to enforce anything. So they had to have unanimity. unanimity. <laughs> easy for me to say, right? It worked effectively until the early 1820s. Then that unanimous nature started to fall apart. Uh, in 1822, Britain withdrew from the Congress, effectively killing the Congress system. Britain disagreed with the Congress's squashing of a liberal revolt in Spain that would ultimately benefit them trade-wise and hurt France. The Holy Alliance is another part of the, I guess you would say, the negotiations that happened in the Congress of Vienna. Um, and it was something that was proposed by Tsar Alexander I in 1815. Um, it included Russia, Prussia, and Austria <clears throat> because they are the only ones that agreed to it. Uh, England did not agree to be part of this Holy Alliance. Um, and ultimately, it was the first attempt to stop the growth of liberalism, which these nations saw as anti-Christian even, um, or as evil. Uh, it it pro proposed that all monarchs sign a statement agreeing to uphold Christian principles of charity and peace, not just in their own nations, but throughout all of Europe. The plan proved to be overly ideological, however, 
and even impractical, and few took it seriously, especially Britain. You can't really mandate morality. Not that Great Britain wasn't a Christian nation, it was, but it didn't really consider people that lived within Europe that were not Christian, um, not traditional Christians. Uh, it did not take into consideration that the Ottoman Empire, which is still a force in Europe, was not Christian at all, that they were Muslim. Liberals saw it as a sort of unholy alliance of monarchies against liberty and progress, ultimately. It was taken more seriously by monarchs in Eastern Europe as they had squashed attempts at nationalism in that region. So that's why Russia, Prussia, and Austria. Key concept. Key concept. Conservatism and repression. Now let's talk a little bit about conservatism as an ism. We already really discussed a little bit, but let's talk about how it utilized repression and the actions it took during this age of Metternich to keep a cap on um, liberal and national revolts, that pressure cooker of the concert of Europe, if you will. Conservatism, first and foremost, was a reaction to liberalism and a popular alternative for those frightened by the violence, terror, and social disorder of the French Revolution. It was supported by traditional ruling classes, like nobles, and even peasants who still formed a majority of the population. The peasants, in many places, even though they um, were heavily taxed, etc., in these kinds of nations, these conservative nations, they did not like the wild nature of rebellions that were led by the middle class, these liberals. Um, we saw this happen in the French Revolution after the peasants had gained some advantage after the great fear in the earliest days of the revolution. They, that was pretty much all that they wanted. They wanted an end to those feudal dues. Um, and when the reign of terror comes along and Robespierre tries to enforce this, you know, republic of virtue and tries to, I guess you would say, desensitize even more the Catholic nature of France, they don't like it. So this shows you how there can be a kind of agreement between the nobles and the peasants when it comes to conservatism. Maybe not the repression part of it, but the basic ideology. The bourgeoisie constituted the biggest threat to the conservative status quo. The bourgeoisie or the middle classes were usually the ones that were liberals. They were usually the ones that had been indoctrinated by the Enlightenment ideals and were fostering these new ideas for reform and for change. They were the ones that were the you know, backbone of the French Revolution, remember. They are the ones that now that, uh, that the Congress of Vienna is meeting, they want to, uh, the, these are the ones that the Congress of Vienna wants to repress. They want to repress these ideas and try to put it, the genie back in the bottle, which we've already said you can't really do completely. The conservatism throughout Europe embodied, was embodied most by, like I said before, Clemens von Metternich of Austria. Also, Edmund Burke, who we talked about before, in his uh, document that you read, Reflections on the Revolution in France, published in 1790, we saw this beginning of the, um, I guess you would say, definition of what will be 19th century um, conservatism. Uh, also, Joseph Mastris, um, or Mastri, sorry, uh, his conservative views became a cornerstone of the counter enlightenment of the early 19th century. So uh, Metternich, Burke, and Mastri were the three heavyweights when it came to the ideology of conservatism and defining what it meant. Returning the, the status quo, putting the institutions that had stood the test of time, like the monarchy, back in power, the nobility, um, back in the driver's seat, those kinds of things. A good way to explain this when it comes to Metternich of Austria is this. Metternich saw society as an organism, okay, um, a living organism. And just like any other living organism, there is usually, there are parts to that organism that are more important than others. 
um, he would use the example of the human body. If you look at the human body, you see that there are many parts to it, um, to that human, to that uh, living organism of the human body. Um, and there are some parts that are more important than others. For example, if you, if your pinky finger is cut off, assuming your blood clots and you don't bleed to death, you can survive without your pinky finger. It is not that important. Whereas if your head is cut off, you can't survive. So just like the monarchy and the nobility are uh, more important than the peasantry and the lower classes, okay, the monarchy and the nobility would be represented by the head, if you will, and of course the peasantry and the lower classes, the pinky or some other less important part of the body. Okay. Metternich was particularly concerned, as I said before, about the multi-ethnic character of the Habsburg Empire. Nationalism in particular threatened to tear that empire apart if it set in. If any of those small ethnic groups got a wild idea that they should create their own nation and not be part of Austria any longer, the whole thing could unravel. Repression by conservatives occurred in the period between 1815 and 1849, um, largely uh, launched by that concert of Europe that had been established by Metternich at the Congress of Vienna. The ethnic groups of Austria-Hungary in 1910, according to this distribution of races in Austria-Hungary. So you see, this is what I mean by a multi-ethnic empire. All those different colors represent different ethnic groups. If nationalism settles in any of these areas, the entire empire, entire Austrian empire can fall apart. Austria and the German Confederation. They, uh, this multi-ethnic composition of the Habsburg Empire meant that liberalism and nationalism were potentially more dangerous than in other countries. Liberalism and nationalism were centered in universities in the first half of the 19th century. It started off as a university movement um, in the wake of the Napoleonic uh, you know, uh, spread, if you will, throughout Europe in the early 19th century. The Carlsbad Diet, or meeting, was called by Metternich in 1819 to try to deal with this, try to stop the growth of liberalism in these uh, Germanic territories. And this led to what's known as the Carlsbad Decrees. The Carlsbad Decrees of 1819 cracked down on liberalism in universities and drove liberalism and nationalism underground instead basically making the liberals persona non grata, forcing them underground. But as we know, forcing something underground does not necessarily make it go away completely. It will eventually bubble up from and bubble up to the surface by the time we get to the middle of the 1800s. The, materi the uh, materials that advocated German unification were censored so any publications by those uh, German nationals that wanted to create a nation of Germany, um, a unified nation of Germany, as well as any um, national groups within Austria itself would be crushed, would be forced underground and censored. The German Confederation, also known as the Bund, replaced the Holy Roman Empire that had been, you know, large before. Uh, the purpose was to guarantee the independence of the 39 member states. Now remember this is the same reorganization that Napoleon had done uh, when he took over Central Europe. So they maintain that same um, design that had been started by Napoleon. By joint action, the Bund would preserve all German states from domestic disorder. So they would maintain uh, conservatism throughout those German territories. The organization of government was a diet or an assembly and it was presided over by Austria as president. So Austria was actually part of the diet that um, was the German Confederation. So Austria was the big mover and shaker 
and the German Confederation. It was largely ineffective, however, throughout its half century of existence. As we will see, the German nationals that have been pushed underground will not be completely silenced forever. And we'll talk more about how that bubbles up, especially during the 1848 revolutions and then beyond. Prussia, as part of this German Confederation, also needs to be um, looked at. As we know, Prussia was ruled by the Hohenzollern dynasty, a very aggressive royal family with regard to expansion and the use of military force. Uh, the Prussian government and its traditional ruling classes, the Junkers that we talked about before, followed Metternich's lead in repressing liberal and nationalist movements throughout Prussia. Britain, however, will be a little different. Now, the more conservative of the two parties that they had in the two-party system of England were the Tories. They were the ones that had been in charge of the parliament, had the majority in parliament uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. So they were given a lot of power, again, can maintain themselves in power because they had been the ones that defeated Napoleon. And so they were the ones kind of as the majority in the government in England uh, throughout the early 1800s. The Corn Laws of 1815 were, dis were, I guess you would say, outlined or decreed or passed, if you will, by Parliament in 1815 under the Tory um, government, under the Tory majority. Now what the Corn Laws did is it halted the importation of cheaper foreign grain into Great Britain. This was a kind of mercantilist policy, if you will. What they were trying to do was protect the British farmer. Um, when they say corn, they mean all grain products. They were trying to protect the British farmer by allowing the British farmers to get more money for their crops because they didn't have the competition of foreign grain coming in to England and driving the price down. This benefited those wealthy landowners that had large commercial farms, the, the um, gentry, if you will, um, at the expense of the rest of the English population. Because what's going on at the same time here is the rise of industrialization. And many of those peasants that had been forced off the lands during the enclosure movements back in the agricultural revolution now were living in cities and now were working in factories, as we'll talk more about um, in the second part of this unit. But what we see as the working classes grow, and they are the majority of the population, they want cheaper grain because what's happening is their wages, more of their wages are having to go to feed themselves and their families um, because they didn't allow, because the government didn't allow foreign grain to be imported into England, uh, creating competition for the British farmer. So that kept the food prices artificially high in Great Britain, which hurt the working classes the lower classes. The liberals in Parliament were outraged, but they lacked the necessary political influence to repeal the law. In other words, the Whig Party, which were the, uh, the more liberal of the two-party system, did not have the majority in Parliament um, right at the beginning of uh, the 19th century. And so they did not have enough they didn't have enough votes in the parliament to repeal the law that they saw as perhaps a bad one. Habeas corpus, however, uh, was another thing that the Tory party um, repealed. They actually repealed it, repealed it for the first time in English history. Habeas corpus had been um, part of what had been enshrined in the um, British Constitution, the English Constitution of 1689 and they actually repealed it. This is the right to face your accuser in court. Um, and um, that was not, that was unheard of. And that was something that the Tory party did away with, at least for some time, uh, showing how much influence they had 
in the government at this time. So conservatism was in place even in the more, more liberal nations of Europe, if you will. It's all degrees, I guess you would say, of conservatism. This will lead, all of these, uh, the conservative um, repression, if you will, of the Tory party, um, that the Tory party was responsible for in England, will lead eventually to a little uprising um, in 1819 called the Peterloo Massacre. Uh, it was a, what happened was there was a demonstration, there was a demonstration of a pro-liberal crowd listening to speeches that were happening that were against the Corn Laws, the trying to repeal the Corn Laws. Um, there was a group called the Anti-Corn Law League that were trying to drum up support and trying to influence Parliament through speeches and rhetoric and getting petitions signed and those kinds of things to try to um, maybe force the Parliament to um, repeal those corn laws that they saw as, as devastating to the masses living in England. Now this crowd was listening to the rhetoric and things got out of hand. Ultimately, what happened was a riot, and they were attacked by the police. The pro-liberal crowd that was listening to the anti-corn law rhetoric was seen as getting too noisy, and as a way to try to keep things from getting out of control, the police attacked them. Eleven people will be killed by the police, 400 were wounded, including 100 of whom were women. The press was brought under more firm control and mass meetings were abolished after this. This is why the liberals refer to it as the Peterloo Massacre. It happens in Peterloo, England. It's not really a massacre, only 11 were killed, but you see that that phrase, Peterloo Massacre, which is what the press reported it as, this is one of the reasons why the press would be brought under more firm control. Um, and mass meetings would be abolished because, you know, this would incite more rebellions to happen all over England, and so they had to keep a cap on that. So, by 1820, England seemed to be moving towards becoming a repressive authoritarian state. What? That's crazy talk. This is an evolutionary liberal country. This is a, one of the earliest of the constitutional monarchies. How can that be? Well, it won't really be because eventually, soon as a matter of fact, the Tories will lose their majority in Parliament and the Whigs will make a comeback, which we'll discuss. Here's a caricature of the Peterloo Massacre that would be published in newspapers and that's one of the reasons why, you know, the fact that they call it a massacre, the fact that they, they publish uh, political cartoons like this is one of the reasons why they will crack down on the um, on the press, that the Tories will crack down on the press. The text reads, down with them, chop them down, my brave boys, give them no quarter. They want to take our beef and pudding from us. And remember, the more you kill, the less poor rates you'll have to pay. So go at it, lads, show your courage, show your loyalty. So what about France during this period? France began this period as the most liberal large state on continental Europe. Obviously, after defeating Napoleon, restoring the Bourbon monarchy, remember they couldn't completely undo everything that the French Revolution had done. So the Bourbon um, restoration had been established as a constitutional monarchy. The Charter of 1814 is what granted that constitutional monarchy under what the, the name King Louis the 18th, as I said before, there was no Louis the 17th. Um, this is the brother of um, formal, the former Louis the 16th, who became king now. Um, he took the number 18 instead of 17 as an homage to his nephew who never was able to become king, who died in prison during the revolution. Now in 1815, the White Terror occurred in France. It was in, um, thousands of former revolutionaries uh, were ultimately murdered by royalist mobs who had been able to come back into France with the Bourbon Restoration. And they kind of, you know, the shoe was on the other foot type of thing. They decided that they wanted to attack those 
uh, former revolutionaries who they believed did not have enough punishment given to them um, after the Bourbon Restoration took place. Uh, the elections of 1816, however, for the new National Assembly will restore moderate royalists only to power in the assembly rather than the uh, the ones that were out for blood, if you will. And, uh, a Spanish revolution will uh, be crushed in 1823 by France under the constitutional monarchy of Louis XVIII. Uh, French troops were called by the Consort of Europe to go in and restore another Bourbon ruler in Spain. Uh, Ferdinand the seventh remember there had been Bourbons ruling in France since um, the uh, war of Spanish succession had happened under Louis the 14th um, the Spanish had rebelled against that um, in 1823 this Spanish Revolution and um, this Spanish Revolution will be put down by the French forces and uh, the um, Bourbon ruler Ferdinand the seventh will be put back on the throne there this signaled the triumph of conservatism, oddly enough, even though France was technically a more uh, moderately liberal country and with a constitutional monarchy. Um, this by crushing a nationalist rebellion in Spain uh, based on liberalism and nationalism, of course, um, is seen as a triumph of conservative repression. Uh, in 1829, the heir to the throne in Spain was murdered and royalists used the incident as a pretense to crack down on liberalism altogether in Spain and so Spain will undergo uh, gosh a, a, a good long time a good generation or so of repression by the French as a result of this King Louis the 18th shifted from having moderate policies to more staunchly conservative ones as a reaction to this. Uh, the reduction of suffrage, meaning lessening the number of people who could have the vote, uh, even censoring the press um, a bit. So you start seeing less of a, um, you know, more moderate constitutional monarchy and more of a, a conservative constitutional monarchy under King Louis the 18th by the late 1820s key concept. Russia, of course, will be very conservative. Uh, this all really begins, um, as we talked about in the early 19th century, the early 1800s. Uh, it gets worse, however, when um, 1825 rolls around, what's called the Decembrist Uprising. Uh, Tsar Alexander I initially favored enlightened despotism. Okay, uh, he had initially been, you know, more of an enlightened despot. He had admired Napoleon. They were, they had a bromance going on for a little while, remember? But then he turned against Napoleon when it came to the continental system during the Napoleonic Wars. And then Napoleon retaliated by trying to invade Russia. And so from that point on, all bets were off. And Tsar Alexander I became more staunchly conservative from that point forward. Okay, uh, he grew increasingly reactionary after 1815 as well. Uh, his death, however, happened in 1825, and this led to a bit of a power vacuum happening in um, in Russia. His younger brother Nicholas was the first in line to the throne after him, but uh, a group of junior military officers, calling themselves the Decembrists. Uh, they were um, upper-class opponents of the autocratic Russian system of government. Instead, they wanted more um, liberal reforms to be put, maybe more like an enlightened despotism like Alexander I had been earlier in his reign uh, to be um, the name of the game, if you will. They supported popular grievances among Russian society. Uh, they, uh, they were the first real upper-class revolt against Russia's autocratic system of government. Usually the Russian Tsars had the support of the nobility, as we know, the boyars. Um, but uh, that will change with the Decembrist revolt. They sought to prevent Nicholas I from coming to the throne. Now, they, they did this because they saw Nicholas I as even more 
um, conservative and perhaps even reactionary than his older brother Alexander had been and so they wanted to try to nip that conservatism that growth of conservatism in the bud with this Decemberist revolt or Decemberist uprising the revolt was eventually suppressed however by Nicholas I he will be able to crush it heartily um, and assume the throne as Tsar Nicholas I became Europe's most reactionary monarch after that. He has to come to power in the midst of a revolt against him. He crushes it, and that's going to taint his entire reign to be extremely um, reactionary and conservative. Russia became a police state with Nicholas I at the helm. Censorship, a secret police force called the Third Section, and a state-sponsored reign of terror if you will he will send out spies to spy on anybody who tries to speak out against his policies um, he acts like um, a totalitarian dictator some would even say he will not allow for any kind of representative assemblies to come about in Russia he education would be limited and university curriculum was carefully monitored by the state. This resulted in a severe alienation of Russian intellectuals from the rest of Europe. Intellectuals developed two opposing camps during this period in Europe. There were one, there's one group called the Slavophiles that believed that the Russian village, the mirror, the culture in the mirror was superior to that of the West. Traditional what Russian culture should be preserved and um, should be enshrined as better than anything in the West. And so they didn't really like to mimic Western intellectual activity. Uh, the Westerners, however, wanted to extend the genius of Russian culture by industrializing and setting up a constitutional government, which would mean mimicking things that had happened in other parts of Western Europe. So there are two opposite sides here. The Slavophiles were more against the idea of industrialization, whereas the Westerners were pro-industrialization. Ultimately, it will be the Slavophiles that will come out on top, and Russia will be very slow to industrialize as a result. Key concept. Key concept. Now, let's talk a little bit more about liberalism and what defines it. Characteristics, first of all. It's the first major theory in Western thought that saw the individual as a self-sufficient being whose freedom and well-being were the sole reasons for the existence of society. So you can see this is directly connected to Enlightenment idealism directly connected to the idea of the natural rights of man, etc. Classical liberalism, as we call it, because that means the 19th century definition, not the modern day definition, which is quite different. So put that out of your mind now. We're not there yet. But the classical um, definition of liberalism is what we're talking about. They were reformists and political rather than revolutionary in character. They wanted to make reforms in society through political action rather than through revolutionary action. Individuals were entitled to seek their freedom in the face of tyranny, they believed, but they should do so through political movement. Humans have certain natural rights and government should protect them. Of course, that's a direct byproduct of Locke and rights are best guaranteed by a written constitution with careful definition of powers of the government. In fact, even differing powers for different branches of the government. So of course, this goes, this mimics what was seen in the Declaration of Independence in America, the Declaration of the Rights of Man in France. It was Republican in nature, meaning that they wanted more representative forms of government where uh, officials were elected by the people to represent them in the government. Democrats, quote unquote, were more radical than traditional liberals then. 
Classical liberals were more Republicanism, would not modern day Republic ideas, by the way, not modern day Republican, but Republican meaning supporting a um, representative government. Quote, Democrats during this time were more willing to endorse violence to achieve their goals. They wanted um, more direct democracy rather than a representative democracy. They would be more like the sans culotte were in the French Revolution, where they wanted all uh, people to have a direct vote on a daily basis for what happens in society. That's just very difficult to have a direct democracy like that in a large state. Okay, liberalism in economics, of course, is more like what we saw in um, the uh, Enlightenment. Some economists of the era, like Ricardo and Malthus, both of them we will talk about um, in a the, the next lecture of this unit. Ricardo and Malthus painted a kind of bleak picture of things. Um, economics became known as a dismal science as a result. Uh, we will see that these are people that are a little different than tr the traditional um, Enlightenment economic theorists like Adam Smith. Um, the liberalism and economics could go either way. They could be more optimistic like the Adam Smith Wealth of Nations type people or they could be more pessimistic like the Ricardo and Malthus type people. And again we'll talk more specifically about them in the next lecture. Um, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, as we discussed from the Enlightenment, became kind of the Bible of capitalism. Mo it was the most productive economy, he believed, was one that allowed for the greatest measure of individual choice, that invisible hand of the self-regulating market, meaning supply and demand determining the market, rather than it being artificially manipulated by the government. Laissez-faire, of course. Now, as I mentioned, we talk about the others. David Ricardo, the iron law of wages. Ricardo said that a plentiful supply of workers would ultimately keep wages low. It was based on supply and demand. If you have a lot of workers and fewer jobs, the supply of workers is greater than the amount of jobs, so therefore wages will stay low and that will benefit ultimately the owners of the factories, not the working class. Thomas Malthus believed the human population would eventually grow so much as it had been doing since the agricultural revolution that they would eventually outstrip the food supply even with the agricultural revolution and the production of more food, eventually the growth of the population would reach a point where it would outstrip the food supply that could be supplied, resulting in massive famines. And this was what was known as a Malthusian trap. More food, more people. Okay, eventually the more people will outgrow the more food. <laughs> and eventually that's going to lead to less people because they die of famine, starvation. Another ism that we see is that's associated with liberalism is utilitarianism and this was founded by Jeremy Bentham in England. He was a Whig in Parliament, the more liberal party in Parliament, um, and he believed that any law on the books, whether it's a one that's old on the books or one that is being considered to be passed by Parliament, um, should pass the principle of utility, okay, uh, kind of a litmus test, if you will. A utility of any proposed law or institution needed to be based on, quote, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. In other words, if you looked at a law, whether one being proposed or one that already existed, and you saw that it promoted the greatest good for the greatest number of people, then it was a good law. If it did not, then it was a bad law, and it either needed to A, not be passed in the first place, or B, if it was already in place, it needed to be repealed. So if you look at utilitarianism under Jeremy Bentham, you will see that he's very much like Rousseau. 
greatest good for the greatest number sounds very similar to the general will, does it not? Bentham was a major proponent of creating what were known as the poor laws in England. Ultimately, since the greatest number of people that lived in England by his time were the working class poor, that the government needed to pass laws that would benefit them, that would help to alleviate their misery. So this was the beginning of a big push for reform in England through the British Parliament and the rise of the Whig Party in the 1820s and 30s and 40s. John Stuart Mill was another Whig um, liberal in um, England and he wrote a book called On Liberty in 1859 and it was a classic statement on liberty of the individual. In this he argued for absolute freedom of opinion to be protected from both government censorship and the tyranny of the majority. So he argued that yeah utilitarianism is great but you also must consider the minority opinion. You need to temper any law that is passed even though it may be for the greatest good for the greatest number you need to temper it for what is good for the minority opinion as well. Later along with his wife he even argued for women's rights in England women's suffrage even and he wrote a book called On the Subjugation of Women in 1867 so he was an very early proponent of women's rights and women's suffrage in England. Key concept. Now, understanding how government worked in England is important for this era of history. Yes, there will be some times like in the early 1800s where the Tory party, the more conservative party, has the majority and things will be a little bit more conservative and even in some cases authoritarian. But you also see other times when elections change things and the Whig party or the more um, um, liberal party will gain a majority and they will be able to push through some reforms. So what you see happening in England over time is the process known as evolutionary liberalism. The approach to reform measures in England is evolutionary. Slow and steady reforms rather than rapid reforms happening all at once or overnight. Slow, steady, small increments of reform over a longer period of time ultimately meant that England's reform process had staying power. That instead of having a revolution to try to make changes in society, they didn't need a revolution. Instead, slow and steady reforms through the electoral process, through the governing process with Parliament in this um, constitutional monarchy meant that they didn't have to have a revolution. And this is one of the reasons why, when I mentioned before, that in 1848, when everybody on the continent is revolting, there are two major exceptions. England is one of them and Russia is the other. The reason why England didn't have to have a revolution in 1848 was because all of the demands being made by those revolutionaries in Europe in 1848 for reform in the electoral process and more um, classical liberal ideas in the government, they were already being addressed in England by the governing forces themselves, by the parliament. Okay, so evolutionary liberalism. Between 1820 and 1830, young reform-minded Tories such as George Canning and Robert Peel gained influence in Parliament in the 1820s. They allied with liberal Whig reformers, so they were of the Conservative Party, Tories, but they were more young Tories. Um, neocons, if you will. <laughs> they uh, were more reform-minded. They were more willing to reach across the aisle to the uh, Whigs and advocate for some changes to be made. So you see both parties between the 1820s and 30s, the Whigs and the Tories, with the new leadership of the younger, more reform-minded Tories, were willing to 
work together to advocate for reforms and changes in the government. That's what we call it evolutionary liberalism. Basically, the difference between the Whigs and the Tories were the speed that these reforms should happen. The Tories think they should have a little bit more slow, steady reform, whereas the Whigs would push for more to happen more quickly. That's basically the only difference. Reforms that were put through during this time period, first of all, Britain, as we talked about before, abandoned the Congress system as part of that concert of Europe in 1822. Um, they reformed um, the prisons and the criminal code. Uh, they allowed for membership and labor unions. Labor unions had been outlawed since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution that happened in Great Britain earlier than it did in other places, as we will discuss in the next lecture. Uh, but we will see that labor unions were outlawed everywhere um, and they were allowed in England earlier than they were anywhere else on the continent of Europe. Uh, and they also, these reforms by these, you know, um, Tories and liberal, ref uh, the Tories and the Whig reformers um, reaching across the aisle, um, a big part of this was also establishing an efficient metropolitan police force. What we mean by that is city-based police forces um, to maintain law and order and to make sure that um, crime was kept at a minimum. Now because uh, Robert Peel was uh, in charge of Parliament when this law was passed, the Metropolitan Police Force in London, the city-based police force in London, was named, nicknamed, I guess I should say, after him. They're called the Bobbies because his name is Robert. Get it? So the Bobbies that you still um, see today um, in uh, London, the Metropolitan Police Force, they're still called Bobbies. They, are, of course, are um, nicknamed after Robert Peel, who began them while he was at the head of parliament. Religious reforms were also advocated and pushed through. Um, in the 1673 Test Act that uh, had been in place for so long was repealed. Remember, it had banned non-Anglicans from holding office in England, which was designed to keep Catholics from being able to have any political say in England, including being the king. Um, the Catholic Emancipation Act of, 16, of 1829 instead granted full civil rights to Roman Catholics once again. Earl Grey, yeah, he's a real person, not just a T. Earl Grey was the Whigs leader during this time, was asked by the new king, George IV, to form a new government in 1830. Now, let me explain what this means. When, um, elections are held for the British Parliament and the majority shifts from one party to another from say the Tory party which it had been under Robert Peel to the Whig party under Earl Grey. Uh, the, what happens is the monarch is uh, invites the um, head of that new party, the leader of that new party that has now gained the majority in Parliament to Buckingham Palace and they uh, officially recognize that um, a new majority is being held in the parliament by quote asking them to form a new government. It's really not a new government, it's just the formal recognition that the power has shifted from one party to another as a majority in the parliament. So this happens under George IV in 1830. Now remember George IV was the next one after George the Third, Mad King George the Third? Um, George the Fourth was not quite as crazy um, as George the Third, but uh, he dies in 1830. Um, um, shortly after he had, you know, allowed for this uh, new government to be formed, and his brother William the Fourth comes to the throne. The Whigs were heavily supported by the middle class, okay? So now we have William IV as a new king, and you have Earl Grey as the Whig leader, now in charge of the, as the prime minister of a, um, um, in England with the Whigs 
as the majority. The Whigs, when they have the majority, will push through another set of reforms. Now, remember what I said before, evolutionary liberalism, both parties are advocating different reforms. Okay, we just talked about the ones that the Tories had done um, in the 1820s. Now in the 1830s, with the Whigs at the helm, they will push through some reforms as well. And probably the biggest and most significant is the Great Reform Bill of 1832. It was considered a milestone in British history. Okay, it, spur, it was spurred on by a recent cholera epidemic that had happened throughout England. Uh, people demanded a more rep responsive government to the, the problem, to the epidemic. Hmm. And uh, this ultimately what it does is it helps to increase the number of voters from 6% of the population to 12% of the population. Now, folks, that doesn't sound like a lot to you all, however, but I do need to point this out to you. Out of all the people who lived in England, only 6% had the right to vote prior to this. Now, with the Great Reform Bill of 1832, 12% of the total population have the right to vote. That doubled the number of people who had the right to vote. That is significant in and of itself. Another thing that it did was it eliminated the underpopulated rural electoral districts. They were known as rotten boroughs. Um, many of uh, these areas did not have high populations in them any longer because so many people had moved out of the rural areas into the urban areas in search of work due to industrialization. But these rural electoral districts still had a lot of sway when it came to the number of representatives they got to have in the parliament. And they also mostly supported the House of Lords because they were, you know, the people who did live there were of the gentry and of the upper classes. So what they needed to do now is they needed to re evaluate the districts in England to better represent the population shifts that had happened due to industrialization. So they replaced these underpopulated rural electoral districts with representation from new manufacturing districts and cities that rose up due to the Industrial Revolution. In other words, just like we do in our nation, every 10 years we have a census in order to see if we need to um, change how the districts, um, the electoral districts are, are laid out. If we have a growth in population in one area and a, uh, a you know, decline of population in another area, well, the, the representation has to change to better reflect the population changes. Since more people were now living in the cities in England rather than in the rural areas, they needed to give the cities, the urban areas, more votes, more representatives to better represent the growth of that area. Okay, kind of like we do with our House of Representatives. This resulted in the supremacy of the House of Commons over the House of Lords in Parliament. Now those middle class bourgeoisie who own the factories and those kinds of things had more votes um, in those uh, because they were the ones living in the cities because they were the ones running the factories and, the, and they were the employers of the working class people and they now had more of a say. Now we don't have the workers having a say yet. We don't have them having the vote yet, but at least this is a step in the right direction. Ultimately, it gave more upper middle class people the right to vote. It lowered the property qualifications for voting, this great reform bill of 1832, and it redrew um, um, the political boundary maps um, to better represent the growth in population. The Whig Party will also initiate some labor reform. The Factory Act of 1833 was a big one. Basically, this act said that there will be no body under the age of nine allowed to work in the factories. I know that sounds ludicrous to you all, but yes, there were children that worked in the factories that started working in the factories as soon as they could stand upright. Um, so this made it so nobody under the age of nine could work in a factory. 
They also passed the Poor Law of 1834, which required healthy unemployed workers to live in workhouses if they could not find a job on their own. Now, the poor laws were initially designed to be a kind of, um, I guess you would say, unemployment relief program, but ultimately forcing these individuals to live in the workhouses and to work on public works projects in exchange for a small daily wage or sometimes even just a daily meal, a bowl of gruel, if you will, meant that it was very difficult for any of these people to ever get out of the workhouses, to ever be able to look for a real job or get a real job. So this became almost like a prison sentence to the unemployed in the long run. The Mines Act of 1842 prohibited child labor in mines altogether. Uh, children were put to work in mines because they were small and they could crawl into the small nooks and crannies. Uh, but ultimately, many of them were dying as a result of, you know, breathing in the coal mine dust um, or cave-ins. So uh, prohibiting child labor in mines. Uh, the Ten Hour Act of 1847 um, was also passed by the Whig majority that limited work hours for women and children to only 10 hours a day rather than 16. So these were all seen as big reform acts under the Whig party during the 1830s and 40s. Key concept. Now, even though the Whigs in Parliament were pushing through some reforms, there were still many in society who wanted more reforms to be put into place, in particular when it came to voting. Yes, the Great Reform Bill doubled the number of people who had a say in government, but it was far, far from universal suffrage, meaning all people having the vote, or even universal male suffrage, all men having the vote. So there was a group known as the Chartists, sometimes it's an ism called Chartism, okay, who fought to try to gain universal suffrage in England. The Chartist movement was known as that because they had what was called the People's Charter, a big ginormous petition that was sent all over England to be signed by millions. Uh, the People's Charter also demanded other things like secret balloting, no property qualifications for members of parliament salaries for members of parliament so you know people could afford to serve in office uh, equal electoral districts and again more into those rotten boroughs and also more regular annual elections for parliament these were all things that the chartists were pushing for the significance of it of this movement Although the movement failed initially, it started in the 1830s, moved into the 1840s, and every time the People's Charter was presented to Parliament, it would ultimately be shot down. But what is significant about the People's Charter, about the Chartist movement, is that even though it initially fails to get anything done, all of the ideas in the People's Charter would eventually be adopted one by one by the Parliament in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Evolutionary liberalism, folks, one by one, all of the demands that were in the People's Charter would finally be put in place, just not all at once like the Chartist wanted. And this is why we call it evolutionary liberalism. And this is why England didn't have to have a revolution in 1848 when the rest of Europe seem to be undergoing one. The Corn Laws would be repealed in 1846. The Anti-Corn Law League that had been uh, around that was led by Richard Cobden and John Bright argued for lower food prices. This is not part of the, the Chartist movement, but it was seen as kind of piggybacking on it. 
pushing for the repeal to those corn laws would actually bring some real relief to the working class poor in English society. Um, and it finally would be repealed in 1846, even though it had been being pushed to be repealed since its onset in 1815. It took over 30 years to repeal this act. There's a reason why it was finally repealed. It was partly a reaction to the 1840s Irish potato famine. When the famine hit, it was so devastating in Ireland that about a million people died of starvation within the first year, 1847, 1848. Wait, 1845, 1846, I apologize. This will lead to many other Irish to leave Ireland in search of work and food. Many will come to the United States in the mid-1800s, but even more will go into England proper. And because of this massive influx of Irish into England, they couldn't, the English farmers could not keep up with the demand for food. So they had to repeal the corn laws to allow for foreign importation of grain in order to feed the ever-growing population. Internal unrest in England was relatively small compared to other countries in Europe during the rest of the 19th century. As I said before, no revolution of 1848 in England due to the evolutionary liberalism put forth by the British Parliament. People saw reform was possible without a revolution. It was evolutionary. It was slow, but steady changes were being made. Queen Victoria, who reigned from 1837 to 1901, had a relatively peaceful reign, and it's known as the Victorian era because most of this reform happens during her um, reign. So the Victorian era, she worked very well with Parliament um, whenever the Whigs or the Tories were in power. And so this era, this Victorian era, is seen as a very stable governing time in English history. So what is the impact of liberalism ultimately? It inspired various revolutionary movements of the early 19th century. It influenced revolutions in France in 1830 and 1848, which will be discussed later. Liberalism became embodied over 10 constitutions that were secured between the years 1815 and 1848 in the states of the German Confederation. It influenced reform measures in Britain from the 1830s into the 20th century, as we just discussed, through the evolutionary liberalist pro uh, liberalism pro progression. It inspired German student organizations that had been pushed underground initially uh, to eventually be able to make a stand. And it will impact Prussian and later German life in the late 19th century, as we will see in units moving forward. It also resulted in some mild reforms, even in places like Russia in the early 20th century, which will be discussed later. Key concept. Nationalism. This is probably one of the most significant of the isms that comes out of this time period. Characteristics. They sought to turn cultural unity into self-government. Usually nationalism was based on some kind of commonality that a group of people had. It could be a common language or a common history or common cultural traditions. And this could bring about unity, the feeling of unity and common loyalties to one another. It was supported usually by liberals and especially by those even more radical liberals known as Democrats, which we'll talk more about later. The immediate origins of the growth of nationalism in Europe, though, were in the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, which were both very nationalistic in nature. Johann Gottfried Herder was regarded as the father of modern nationalism in particular in the German Confederation. He saw every cultural group as unique and possessing a distinct national character. In fact, he called it the Volkgeist, 
okay, that it would evolve over many centuries. No one culture, he argued, is superior to another. His ideas led to the notion that every nation should be sovereign and independent and contain all the members of the same nationality in them. Johann Gottlieb Fitch was another early um, nationalist in Germany as well. He's considered by some as the father of German nationalism as, um, as a matter of fact. He spoke of a German superiority over the other peoples um, in Europe and even criticized the Jews. It will be Fitch's ideas that will eventually be embraced by people like the Nazis in Nazi Germany. Key concept. National revolutionary movements between 1815 and 1829, many of which will be attempted to be put down by the concert of Europe that had been designed specifically to squelch these kinds of rebellions, but not all of them will be completely obliterated, as we will see. Spain, in 1820, as mentioned before, there was a liberal revolution that was crushed by French troops that was also authorized by Austria, Prussia, and Russia, but opposed by England, who had left the Congress system. Remember, this is what I discussed before with putting um, Ferdinand VII back on the throne, that Bourbon um, back on the throne in Spain. In Naples in 1820, there was a revolutionary movement where the liberals in Naples protested the absolute rule of Ferdinand I of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. It will fail as well and be put down by the conservatives. In Piedmont, another Italian city-state in 1820, an attempted uprising was eventually crushed by the Austrian forces that controlled most of northern Italy. So failure, failure, failure so far. But here is a success, the Greek Revolution also known as the Greek War for Independence between 1821 and 1829. Europeans were concerned with what was known as the Eastern Question. Which European countries would fill the void um, in the Balkans region resulting from a decline of the Ottoman Empire? By the time we get to the 1820s, the Ottoman Empire is still around, but it is weakening. It is weakening steadily. Um, and as we can see, as evidenced by the Greeks revolting against the Ottoman control of that territory and them eventually having success. But who is going to fill that void, that power vacuum, if the Ottoman Empire declines? That was the Eastern question. Because we don't want balance of power being um, um, disturbed. England, France, and Russia accepted Greece's Christian appeal to overthrowing or, or by liberating themselves, I guess I should say, from Ottoman control. Um, and they joined into a united force that ultimately defeated the combined Turkish and Egyptian naval forces, trying to maintain Turkish control over Greece. This will lead eventually to the um, liberation of Greece under the Treaty of Adrianople. It recognized Greece as an autonomous state after Russia had defeated the Turks in a war to help them gain that freedom. Now remember, England, France, and Russia all sent some people to Greece to help liberate them. But Russia did the heavy lifting because of their close proximity. The significance, three out of the five members of the Concert of Europe supported nationalism when it came to Greece signaling a shift from a united conservatism to nationalistic self-interest. The reason why these areas uh, supported the Greek push for independence is they all recognized that the Greeks were seen as the, you know, center of Western civilization, the cradle of Western civilization. And if it remained in the hands of the Turks, the Islamic Turks, that that could, you know, that could mean that the Turks could eventually, you know, have more influence um, over Christian Europe. So they had to stop that. <music>
This is a, a painting from Eugene Delacroix called The Massacre at Chios, 1824, where the Greeks are portrayed as helpless victims at the hands of ruthless Turkish soldiers. Romanticism was a big part of these revolutions. We'll talk more about romanticism at the end of this lecture, that artistic movement that reflects this era. Now the revolutions of 1830 are another nationalistic revolution that takes place uh, in Europe. Uh, they were sparked by a wave of liberalism and nationalism against perceived conservative oppression. Again, that pressure cooker, tsh -tsh -tsh, there was some steam that needed to be let out and the re revolutions of 1830 was one of those little, you know, um, release valve of that steam with that pressure of the concert of Europe. Uh, it really begins in France. Of course it does. It begins in France with the July Revolution of 1830. King Charles X sought to impose absolutism by rolling back the constitutional monarchy that had been put in place after the fall of Napoleon. In response, a radical revolt in Paris forced the reactionary Charles X to abdicate his throne. And instead, a new dynasty was formed under Louis Philippe, who will reign from 1830 to 1848. He was from the Orléans family, and he became the new king under a new constitutional monarchy known as the bourgeoisie king. He refused to wear a crown in public. Instead, he wore a top hat like a regular bourgeoisie in France. By the way, those of you who know the, the play Les Miserables, um, the revolution, quote unquote, that is happening during that play is a byproduct as part of this whole July revolution that's going on, 1830. The impact of the July revolution was, it sparked a wave of revolutions throughout Europe. When France sneezes, the rest of Europe catches a cold was a very famous saying about this time period because whenever rebellions and revolutions start, they seem to start in France and spread from there. That is why oftentimes these revolutions in the mid 19th century are referred to as a revolutionary virus, in particular, the ones that happened in 1848. This of course is another Delacroix, Eugene, Eugene Delacroix, a painting from the Romantic period, Liberty Leading the People. It's actually painted to represent the July Revolution in 1830. Even though many times now we see it being used to, you know, help teach the French Revolution of 1789, in reality it wasn't paid and painted until 1830 with the July Revolution of that time period. In Italy, there's also rebellion in the 1830s, 1831 to 1832 kind of being influenced by what had happened in France, Italian nationalists called for unification, creating one unified Italy. And this was led by Giuseppe Mazzini and his secret revolutionary society known as Young Italy. The Carbonari were known as secret nationalist societies that advocated force, the use of force to achieve national unification in Italy. They also became part of this movement. Austrian troops, remember the Austrians are in control of most of Northern Italy after 1815 because of the redrawing the boundaries of Europe at the Congress of Vienna. So Austrian troops will come to defend their claim over those territories with these rebellions. Under Metternich's enforcement, the Concert of Europe's philosophy crushed the disorganized revolutionaries and maintained Austrian control over northern Italy. The Italian Risorgimento, as it was, recall, as it was called, or resurgence of the Italian spirit, however, continued. Mazzini's dream would be Italian unification. Um, and eventually, in another um, well, in about another 20 to 30 years, it will be achieved. They will pick up where Mazzini left off, and you will have the unification of Italy in the 1860s.
In the German states, there's also some re revolutions in the 1830s, 1830 to 1833 in the German Confederation. Um, the, Carlsbad, the Carlsbad Decrees of 1819 had effectively restricted freedom, uh, freedom throughout Germany, forcing it underground, those nationalistic movements forced underground. But as I said before, they don't go away completely. They're still bubbling up to the surface now and then. And they do so in the 1830s. The July Revolution in France inspired those German nationalists. Remember, when France sneezes, Europe gets a cold. And uh, they rebel. Yet, the liberal and nationalistic desires for German unification were easily crushed by Metternich's domination of the German Confederation in the Bund, okay, As, and his influence on Prussia. But this shows you that German unification based on German nationalism is not something that can be just forced underground and forgotten about forever. It will bubble to the surface again in 1848, be crushed then, it will bubble to the surface again in the 1860s, and finally achieve German unification. But instead of the liberals being in charge of the movement, it will be the conservatives. We'll talk more about that in a later unit. Belgium, 1830. Okay, Belgium had been merged with Holland in 1815, we discussed at the beginning of this lecture, but the upper classes of Belgium resisted rule by the Dutch, who had a different language, a different religion, and a different economic life. So the July Revolution in France inspired a revolt against the Dutch rule in Brussels, led by students and industrial workers. When France sneezes, Europe gets a cold. The Dutch army, however, was defeated and forced to withdraw from Belgium by a Franco-British fleet as part of the um, Concert of Europe. A national congress wrote a liberal Belgian constitution, however. In 1839, the great powers declared the neutrality of Belgium, and ultimately Belgium will be able to become its own free state. The Polish Rebellion of 1830-31. Nicholas I, as Tsar of Russia, crushed a nationalist uprising that challenged Russia's historic domination of Poland. Remember, when his older brother was Tsar, at the Congress of Vienna, they had given most of Poland to Russia and Nicholas, I'm sorry, Alexander I would act as, that Russia would act as the uh, overseer over, um, the king, if you will, over Poland, over that part of Poland anyways. Um, after he is gone in 1825, not only does Nicholas have the Decembrists to worry about within Russia challenging his authority, but he have the Poles trying to seize the opportunity to free themselves from Russian domination as well. He will crush those thing, those um, rebellions. Um, but in 1832, the Organic Statute of 1832 declared Poland to be an integral part of the Russian Empire. So the Russians will still maintain control over Poland, but Poland is recognized as an integral part of Russian, the Russian Empire, rather than just a subservient state. Key concept. The Revolutions of 1848. An overview. This is considered a watershed political event of the 19th century. The 1848 revolutions were influenced by nationalism, liberalism, and romanticism, as well as economic dislocation and instability. Only Great Britain and Russia avoided significant upheavals in the 1848 era. Liberal reforms in Britain prevented serious popular discontent, that evolutionary liberalism that we associate with the British government created stability, so there was no need for a revolution. Conservative oppression in Russia prevented liberal revolution from being able to take hold, exactly the opposite end of the spectrum. It was too oppressive, and no real middle class existed in Russia 
to filter the revolutionary demands to the rest of the country. Neither liberals nor conservatives would be able to gain permanent upper hand at the end of the 1848 revolutions. And ultimately, the status quo that had been established by the Concert of Europe at the Concert at, sorry, at the Congress of Vienna would be maintained after the year of upheaval. This resulted, however, in the end of serfdom in Austria and Germany. Universal male suffrage will begin in France. Parliaments will be established in the German states, although they will be controlled by the princes and the aristocrats rather than the population. It also stimulated unification impulses in Prussia, which will become Germany, and Sardinia Piedmont in Italy, which will become, of course, the Kingdom of Italy. Let's discuss how these revolutions took place in different places all throughout Europe. It begins in France. <clears throat> it begins in February of 1848 with what is called the February Revolution. The working class and liberals were unhappy with King Louis Philippe, who is a Bourbon king, especially with his minister, Francois Guizot, who opposed electoral reforms. Louis Philippe ultimately was forced to abdicate his throne in February of 1848 as a result of this rebellion of the working class and liberals. The Second French Republic would be claimed, ending the constitutional monarchy in exchange for once again an experiment with a republic. This republic will be led by liberal Alphonse Lamartine, who allied with the bourgeoisie. Louis Blanc, who was a socialist thinker, led the working classes and demanded work for the unemployed to be guaranteed by the government in the Second French Republic. National workshops would be created to provide work for the unemployed as a result. Unfortunately, they did not last very long. Reforms put in place, however, were slavery was abolished in the French Empire. A 10 hour workday was established in Paris and they abolished the death penalty. In April of 1848, there were elections held for a new constituent assembly that saw conflict between the liberal capitalists or the bourgeoisie and the socialists. In other words, the divisions among the revolutionaries who had initially rebelled against the more conservative king, Louis Philippe, now were showing division in how they wanted to run the new government of the Second French Republic. Workers sought a revolutionary republic after Louis Blanc was dropped from the assembly. And this will lead to a new revolution taking place in June, 1848, the June days. The cause was the government closed the national workshops that had been established by Blanc. This will mark the beginning of class warfare in France between the bourgeoisie and the working class. The workers sought war against poverty and the redistribution of income. And barricades were put up in the streets to oppose the government forces. This painting shows the Battle of Soufla barricades at Rue Soufla Street on 24 June 1848. General Cavignac assumed dictatorial powers and crushed the revolt, resulting in about 10,000 dead. This was a temporary victory for the conservatives. And this will eventually lead to a set of new elections in the fall of 1848. Louis Napoleon, nephew to Napoleon Bonaparte, defeated Cauvignac and became the president of the Second French Republic. In 1852, Louis Napoleon consolidated power and was able to use the plebiscite, that national referendum, a yes or no vote that he offered to all male voters. 
uh, to become Emperor Napoleon III of the Second French Empire. So between the beginning of the Revolution of 1848 in France and the end, Louis Napoleon now became emperor and there was a Bonaparte on the throne again in France. This means that the Second French Republic is now gone. Ultimately, this means a failure of the Revolution of 1848 in France. Italy. Italian nationalists and liberals sought to end the foreign domination of Italy. In 1848, the, the Italian states of Milan, Lombardy, and Venetia expelled their Austrian rulers. That northern part of Italy was still under the control of the Austrian Empire. The Bourbon rulers that were on the throne in Sicily and Naples were also defeated. This area is also known as the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Sardinia Piedmont ultimately declared war on Austria. Giuseppe Mazzini was the Italian national who had established the Roman Republic in 1849, and he was protected by Giuseppe Garibaldi and his forces in the south. The idea was that they would be able to unite to form a common Italy in opposition to the Austrian overlords in the north. Pope Pius IX was forced to flee Rome. Unfortunately, there was a failure with this revolution as well in Italy. Ultimately, it resulted in a conservative victory and the reestablishment of Austrian control over northern Italy. The Austrian general Radeschi crushed the Sardinia Piedmont movement and regained control over Lombardy and Venetia. French troops took back the Papal States as well. Causes for failure are similar throughout the 1848 revolutions, no matter which country you see it taking place in. First and foremost, the rural people, the people in the countryside, largely did not support the revolutions, but instead were supported the conservative regimes that were already in power um, after the Congress of Vienna. The revolutionaries were not united either, as we saw in Germany and in France. Fear of radicals among the moderates were also there. And there was a lack of leadership and administrative experience among the revolutionaries. Now let's see what happened in Austria. The Habsburg Empire was vulnerable to the revolutionary challenge of the nationalists. Ethnic minorities sought nationalistic goals. Hungarians, Slavs, Czechs, Italians, Serbs, Croats, and others were all seeking to create their own ethnic national states. We've talked about Austria being a polyglot empire in the past, and the fear of nationalism taking hold was real there. The entire empire could unravel if nationalism took hold. Germans were only 25% of the population in Austria. The Austrian government in turn was reactionary. Liberal institutions were non-existent, especially during the age where Metternich was the chief minister. Social reliance on serfdom ultimately doomed the masses of the people to a life without hope in Austria. The February Revolution that took place in France sparked a rebellion for liberal reforms throughout Europe. When Paris sneezes, Europe gets a cold. Now Hungary as part of the Austrian Empire. Louis Kossuth was a Hungarian leader. He was a member of the Magyar ethnic group. The Magyars were the largest ethnic group in Hungary and they were now demanding their own independent country. 
The Czechs in Bohemia, as well as three northern Italian provinces, also declared their autonomy from Austria in 1848, the spring. The Austrian Empire was virtually on the verge of collapse as a result. Students and workers staged mass demonstrations throughout the empire. Metternich was forced to flee the country. The Hungarian armies drove within sight of Vienna and demanded their independence. However, by the end of 1848, the Hungarians and the other national groups were ultimately defeated. The Austrian army regroups in the fall of 1848 and they gain the aid of the Slavic minorities who resisted the Magyar control over the Hungarian territory. The Austrian and Russian armies defeated the Hungarian army, ultimately. Austria got help from Russia and was able to re-solidify their control over their empire. Hungary would have to wait until 1866 for autonomy from Austria. The revolution failed. The revolutionary government failed to govern effectively, as was the case in Italy. The Habsburgs were able to restore royal absolutism throughout the Austrian Empire as a result. Bohemia was another part of the Austrian Empire that attempted to revolt. The Prague Conference, taking place in the same year, 1848, developed the notion of Austroslavism, a constitution with autonomy within the Habsburg Empire. A pan-Slav Congress, however, failed to unite the Slavic people in the empire. The Austrian army ultimately was able to reoccupy Bohemia and crush the rebellion there. The Italian revolution against Austrian rule also failed. The other German states within the Austrian Empire, as well as other areas of the German Confederation, also failed to create a nation in 1848. Revolutions were also inspired in the 1848 revolutions by those that were taking place in France. Liberals in these German states, the German Confederation, demanded a constitutional government and a union or federation of German states with real political control, not just economic unity. In May of 1848, those liberals came together in Frankfurt, which was a powerful city in Prussia, to uh, create a parliament to have a meeting to determine whether or not they should unite as one German nation. The liberal and nationalist leaders called for elections to a constituent assembly from all states in the German Confederation, the Bund, for the purpose of unifying the German states and creating a unified Germany. They sought a war with Denmark in order to annex the territory of Schleswig and Holstein. In response, Prussia declared war on Denmark to seize those, those territories. The Frankfurt Parliament then presented a constitution for a united German federation to the authoritarian absolute king of Prussia. It selected that Prussian king, Frederick William IV, to be their new emperor. However, since they were of a liberal mindset, they wanted his power to be limited. They wanted a constitutional monarchy, not an absolute monarchy. And King Frederick William IV was an absolute monarch within Prussia. This will cause a problem for him. He does not want his power limited. The Prussian king, Frederick William IV, in turn, rejected the liberal constitution. 
he rejected becoming the king of a larger united Germany if his power was going to be limited by a constitution. He claimed the divine right of kings for himself. Allegedly, he stated that he would, quote, not accept the crown from the gutter. He would rather remain the absolute monarch of a smaller Prussia than a constitutional monarch of a larger Germany that would ultimately limit his power. He imposed instead a conservative constitution throughout Prussia that guaranteed royal control of the government. This constitution will last until 1918, even after Germany finally does unify. When Germany does unify in 1871, they will do so with a staunchly conservative constitution with a very powerful authoritarian Kaiser or emperor. The failure of Prussia and Austria to support these unification movements in 1848 resulted in the collapse of that revolution. A liberal-based unified government in Germany was not going to happen. When Germany unifies, it will be under a staunchly conservative regime instead. Liberalism would be rejected by a united Germany. We'll talk more about that in a later unit. Frederick William IV's attempt to subsequently unify Germany, however, under his authoritarian rule in 1848, failed. It will be successful later under one of his successors, William I. Austria demanded Prussian allegiance to the Bund, to the German Confederation that Austria dominated. In effect, this would have com compromised Prussian sovereignty as well. This is referred to as the humiliation of Olmutz. Prussia dropped the plan to unify Germany in 1848 as a result of this, leaving Austria still as the dominant German state in the Bund. But Prussia was up and coming and within a generation they will unify as a strong authoritarian government, as the nucleus of a new German empire. Prussia would seek revenge against Austria for this humiliation in 1866 with the Austro-Prussian War, which we will discuss in a later unit with German unification. Evaluation of the revolutions of 1848. Neither liberal nor nationalist revolutionaries nor those of conservatism at this point were able to maintain their dominance between 1789 and 1848. Liberalism, nationalism, socialism, and democracy all made some gains but were largely kept in check by conservatives, those conservatives that had been in power since the Congress of Vienna were able to maintain their dominance for now. Many of the revolutions were spontaneous movements that really could not effectively maintain popular support. And that's another reason why they failed. The revolutions also were largely urban movements. Conservative landowners as well as peasants living in the countryside, essentially thwarted the revolutions. They did not support them. The middle classes who led the revolutions came to fear the radicalism of their working class allies. For example, Louis Blanc in France. And ultimately this caused division among the revolutionaries, which meant that they couldn't come up to an agreement on how to govern themselves after initially thwarting the conservative um, powers. That is one of the reasons why the conservative powers are able to regain control by the end of the 1848 revolutions, reestablishing themselves. Division among the nationalist ethnic groups in the Austrian Empire also helped destroy the revolutionary movements 
in that area. There are some positive aspects that we should point out, however. Universal male suffrage was introduced in France due to the 1848 revolution. Serfdom remained abolished in Austria and the German states. Parliaments were established in Prussia and other German states, although they would be dominated by the princes and aristocrats rather than the regular middle class people. Prussia and Sardinia Piedmont, Prussia in what will be Germany and Sardinia Piedmont in what will be Italy, emerged eventually with new energy to achieve unification within the next two decades, which we will discuss in Unit 8. The revolutions of 1848 to 49 brought to a close the era of liberal revolutions that had begun in France in 1789. Reformers and revolutionists learned that planning and organization was necessary for success. Spontaneous revolutions did not work, and that was another reason why the revolutions of 1848 failed. Rational <coughs> arguments and revolution would not always assure success. The age of Romanticism gave way to an age of realism, as well as realpolitik, a new political ideology that will help the unification movements in both Italy and Germany in the 1860s and 70s. We will discuss that more in Unit 8. Key concept. Romanticism. First, we're going to cover the characteristics of Romanticism. Romanticism emphasized emotion over reason, emphasizing the human senses, passion, and faith. This was largely a knee-jerk reaction against the age of reason that had ultimately produced the Industrial Revolution, which many Romantics saw as ugly, unseemly, and inhuman or inhumane in many cases uh, with the plight of the working class poor. Romanticism also glorified nature. It emphasized its beauty and tempestuousness, meaning its, um, its passion and how it could change at any moment. It rejected the enlightenment view of nature as a precise, harmonious whole and rejected deism in favor of organized religion, which fulfilled a kind of emotional need in many people. It rejected the enlightenment view of the past, which was counter progressive to human history as they saw it. Romanticism encouraged personal freedom and flexibility as well. By emphasizing feeling, humanitarian movements were created to fight slavery, poverty, and what they saw as industrial evils. In some cases, it drew upon ideals of the Middle Ages, ideals such as honor, faith, and chivalry, as seen in the novels of Sir Walter Scott. In Central and Eastern Europe, Romantics focused on peasant life and transcribed folk songs, tales, and proverbs. The Philosophical Forerunners of Romanticism Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who we are very familiar with from the French Revolution and the before the French Revolution in the Enlightenment period, is probably one of the most important. He's the one who wrote Social Contract in 1762. If you recall, he believes society and materialism corrupted human nature. He believed man was a noble savage in a state of nature and emphasized emotion. Another philosophical forerunner was Immanuel Kant. He accepted the rationalism of the Enlightenment, 
while also preserving his belief in human freedom, immortality, and the existence of God. He helped establish philosophy as a separate branch from religion. Romanticism was largely inspired by the French Revolution. Strung und Drang, or Storm and Stress, used by German Romantics in the 1770s and the 1780s in conveying, conveying emotional intensity, was a byproduct of this. George William Frederick Hegel. He was a leading figure in German idealism who emphasized this notion. He believed in the dialectic, the initial idea of something or the thesis is challenged by an opposing view, the antithesis, and results in a hybrid or a synthesis. This is actually an offshoot from the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates and his Socratic method. It's just bringing it more up to date. Johann Gottlieb Fricht was another. Fricht wrote in his Addresses to the German Nation in 1806, he developed a romantic nationalism that saw Germans as superior over other peoples. He was also strongly anti-Semitic. A lot of his ideas will eventually influence the Nazis as we approach World War II. Key concept. Romantic poetry. The Romantics believed that poetry was supreme over all other literary forms. They saw poetry as the expression of one's soul. In Germany, Friedrich von Schiller, from 1759 to 1805, wrote about man achieving freedom through the aesthetic of beauty. He spoke of universal human solidarity as well. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe from 1749 to 1832 wrote his most famous book Faust where he seemed to criticize the excesses of romanticism by uh, his main character Faust selling his soul to the devil in return for experiencing all human experience. Goethe can be seen kind of as an anti-romantic, although we still categorize him in the romantic period. In England, William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge were two of the most famous romantic writers. They were deeply influenced by the philosophy of Rousseau and the spirit of the early French Revolution, the moderate phase. In 1798, both poets published lyrical ballads, uh, one of the most influential literary works in the history of the English language. It defied classic rules and abandoned the flowery poetic conventions for ordinary language. Nature was a mysterious force from which the poet could learn. It also portrayed simple subjects in a highly idealized and majestic way. Sir Walter Scott is probably the most famous Scottish romantic. He wrote long narrative poems and historical novels. Rob Roy was one of his most famous from 1817. Ivanhoe, another from 1819, which was a story of a fight between a Saxon and a Norman um, group of knights in medieval England. His works represented the Romantics' interest in history, oftentimes looking back to the past with rose-colored glasses or looking at the past as somehow more palatable than it actually was.
he influenced or was influenced by the German Romanticism of Goethe as well. Lord Byron, 1788 to 1824, another English Romantic poet. He embodied the melancholic Romantic figure, the suffering Romantic, if you will. He died young, which is a very Romantic idea, while fighting for Greek independence against the Turks in 1824. Percy Bysshe Shelley is another Romantic poet from England. His Prometheus Unbound, written in 1820, detailed the revolt of humans against a society that oppresses them. By the way, he also had a very famous romantic writer for a wife, Mary Shelley, who was the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft. Mary Shelley eventually creates one of the most famous Gothic novels ever written, Frankenstein. Literature. George Sand, 1874 to 1876, emphasized themes of romantic love of nature and moral idealism. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe wrote Sorrows of the Young Werther in 1774, Faust in 1806. He is perhaps the greatest of the German romantic authors. Victor Hugo, 1802 to 1885, was a French author, very famous romantic author. He wrote The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Les Miserables, which has become one of the most famous musicals ever to hit the West End or Broadway. Romanticism is evident in his use of fantastic characters, strange settings, and emphasizing human emotions. Also, we see Grimm's fairy tales, a collection of German folk stories come out of this romantic movement. The Grimm brothers were influenced by Herder's views about preserving songs and sayings of the German culture. This is a strong example of how German nationalism and Romanticism as a literary or artistic movement were inherently tied together. Key concepts. What about Romanticism in art? One of the most famous Romantic artists from Spain is Francisco Goya, 1746 to 1828. He was a court painter for the Spanish crown. He painted numerous works of the Peninsular War during the Napoleonic era, his most famous being the 3rd of May, 1814, where he, he shows Spanish revolutionaries being executed by a French firing squad. Caspar David Friedrich is another famous artist from the Romantic period, 1774 to 1840. Wanderers Above the Mist is one of his most famous from 1818. In it, we see the mystical view of the sublime power of nature conveyed in, um, in his use of shading and his use of color, uh, showing humanity versus nature. Eugene Delacroix is another famous painter from this period from France, 1796 to 1863. He's probably the most famous French Romantic painter, interested in the exotic and the dramatic use of color. His most famous work is Liberty Leading the People from 1830. This is his portrayal of the 1838 revolution in France, but oftentimes it's also used now by historians to symbolize the French Revolution from 1789 as well. This is another Delacroix painting, Women of Algiers from 1834. 
This painting is a great example of the romantic fascination with the exotic and the unfamiliar. Theodore Gricolt, 1791 to 1824. Most famous painting was his Raft of the Medusa from 1818 to 1819, based on a shipwreck off the west coast of Africa. His paintings convey themes of pow the power of nature and man's attempt to survive its force. Here is the painting. It's a symbol of political injustice as well as the captain of the ship who was appointed by Napoleon abandoned the ship and left the 149 passengers on one small raft. Romantic artists often use their works to make political and social commentaries, just as they do today. J. M. W. Turner is another famous artist, 1775-1851. He depicted nature's power and terror. Wild storms and sinking ships were his favorite subjects. Here is his, the burning of the houses of lords and commons, which was dated 16 October, 1834. Many paintings that he did were of landscapes, seascapes, sunrises, and sunsets. Here is another famous Turner called The Slave Ship. The power of nature, the power of the sea, as it destroys the slave ship and the slaves are tossed into the ocean to drown. Another, Rain, Steam, and Speed, The Great Western Railway, 1840. Another famous romantic artist was John Constable, 1776 to 1837. He painted rural English landscapes in which human beings were at one with their environment. This one is John Constable's Salisbury Cathedral from the Bishop's Grounds, 1823. Another Music. Between 1820 and 1900, some of the most famous compositions in the music world were created. Romantic music places a strong connection with emotion as well as nationalism, which is conveyed through the use of national folk songs in many cases. Ludwig von Beethoven, 1770-1826, is seen as a transitional figure between the classical and romantic eras. He starts in the classical period, but by the end of his life, he's entered into the romantic era and his works at the end of his life show this romantic era. One of the first composers to convey inner human emotion through music. Beethoven epitomized the genius who was not constrained by patronage, as were virtually all of his predecessors. He did not, he was not dependent upon royal patronage for his livelihood. Many of his later works were written when he was almost completely deaf. He's also the first composer to incorporate vocal music in a symphony by using the text to one of Schiller's poems, Ode to Joy, in the last movement of his ninth century. If you click on the hyperlink, you can hear an excerpt from Ode to Joy. Franz Schubert, 1797 to 1828. He wrote hundreds of German songs called Leiter that wedded music and romantic poetry. Probably the most famous of these lighter is Ave Maria. Again, you can click on the link and hear an excerpt from the Ave Maria. Hector Berlioz is another very famous composer from this period. He was a major founder of 
programmatic music that sought to convey moods and actions via instrumental music. Symphony Fantastique is his masterpiece and is the first programmatic symphony. Again, you may click on the hyperlink to hear an excerpt. Friedrich Chopin wrote numerous piano works that highlighted Polish folk songs and dances. One of his most famous works is The Nocturne, Opus 9, Number 2. Click on the hyperlink to hear a sample. Franz Liszt is another famous composer from this period, 1811 to 1886. Many of his works reflected his native Hungarian music. You can click on this link of the Hungarian Rhapsody to hear an example. He's sometimes considered the greatest piano virtuoso of the mid-late 19th century. He developed the symphonic poem or tone poem, a single movement symphonic work that was based on a literary or pictorial idea. Giuseppe Verdi is probably the greatest Italian opera composer. One of his most famous Famous works is Rigoletto. If you click on the link, you can hear an excerpt from Rigoletto. Richard Wagner was the German opera composer, 1813 to 1883. Along with Verdi, Wagner is considered the greatest opera composer of the 19th century. His development of the, quote, music drama is often considered the culmination of the Romantic era. You may click on the hyperlink of Rut to hear an excerpt from Ride of the Valkyries, probably one of his most famous works. You can also click on the next link to hear a spoof on the Ride of the Valkyries, Kill the Wabbit from Bugs Bunny. Wagner was a German nationalist composer who strongly emphasized Germanic myths and legends. And the Nazi party later on during World War II will use a great deal of his works as the score for their own propaganda films. Peter Tchaikovsky from Russia, 1840 to 1893. He's probably the most well-known of the Russian Romantic composers, perhaps the most gifted European composer in the creation of beautiful melodies in his symphonies. He often used Russian folk songs in his symphonies and ballets. One of the most famous, of course, is the Nutcracker, another Swan Lake. You can click on the Nutcracker link to hear an excerpt from Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. <clears throat> His 1812 Overture, composed in 1882, and the March Slav, composed, composed in 1876, are but two examples of his use of folk songs and the creation of memorable melodies. The 1812 Overture, you can click on to hear a link, to, to hear an excerpt from this, from this, and it is written during what well, is written about the Napoleonic invasion of Russia, complete with cannon sounds towards the end. Architecture. The Romantic era returned to medieval ideas in certain respects. Gothic revival architecture returned in some notable cases. The architecture for the British Houses of Parliament, which were rebuilt in the mid-1800s during this Romantic era, are perhaps the best and most famous examples of um, Gothic revival architecture. And here are pictures. You see they look very much like the Gothic cathedrals from the High Middle Ages with the spires. Romanticism's connection to politics and revolution also need to be addressed in this mix. Philosophy, 
They believed in revolutionary movements that would give people more freedom and control over their lives. They supported nationalistic movements that emphasized the cultural traditions and languages of Europe's varied peoples. They also uh, liked revolutionary movements, which were highly idealized and probably not attainable in light of the political realities of the era. The art of the period tended to idealize these movements. In France, Eugene Delacroix that we saw before, his massacre at Chios of 1824 portrays Greek Christians who seek independence as victims of Ottoman savagery. This, of course, is a byproduct from that Greek War of Independence that was fought during that time period. His, of course, liberty leading the people from 1830, as we saw before, idealized the portrayal of popular revolution with Marianne, who is sort of seen as the symbol of French nationalism, um, the bourgeois and the proletariat revolutions, all incorporated. In Germany, disillusionment with the French Revolution and Napoleon that came after pushed German romantics towards views where individuals would be fulfilled by being part of a national culture united by history. Johann Gottfried von Herder rebelled against Enlightenment rationalism as he was a leader of the Strom und Drang movement. He urged Germans to study German literature and history as believed, and he believed the language was the key to the national unity in Germany, that all of those who spoke German should unite under one nation rather than be divided up into these smaller states, although they had a confederation, they were still not united politically. He believed an individual reached the highest stage of development through a passionate connection with a national community, which he called the Volkgeist, the Volksgeist. Sources such as Grimm's fairy tales further the notion of a German culture to unite around. In Italy, popular revolution led by Mazzini and Garibaldi, which we'll talk more specifically about later, had strong idealistic and romantic overtones. Giuseppe Verdi's operas evoked strong nationalistic views. Verdi was seen in some circles as the figurehead for the Italian unification movement. Some of his early operas can be seen as allegories for the Italian desire to rid Italy of its Austrian and other foreign oppressors. In 1847, one of Verdi's nationalistic operas nearly sparked a massive riot when it was performed. In 1859, the name Verdi was gra uh, graffitied on walls throughout Italy, not only to celebrate the composer, but an acronym, Vittorio Emanuele Re, King d'Italia. In 12 years, Victor Emmanuel would be King of a United Italy. We'll talk more specifically about the unification movement in Italy and how all of this came into play in a later lecture. The eventual failures, however, of the revolutions of 1848 led to disillusionment with romantic goals. And this will eventually pave the way for the rise of realism as a dominant new artistic movement as we move into the era of realpolitik during the unification processes in Italy and Germany. Again, we'll talk about these more specifically in a later lecture.